broadcasting across California. You're watching The Issue Is. Raise your hand if you're still not decided about who you're going to vote for in 2024. I feel that both candidates are more so running to prove a point to themselves, less so than actually do something for me. And I'm not a recent focus group conducted by Frank Luntz for Straight Arrow News. Luntz has conducted more focus groups than just about anybody else over the years, kind of uh, pioneered it on TV. He has appeared on every major network and been a consultant to the top politicians and business leaders in the entire country. Frank Luntz's specialty is understanding how word choice often connects to our emotions and then our decision making. He is credited with popularizing the phrase climate change instead of global warming, death tax instead of estate tax, energy exploration instead of oil drilling, border security instead of border wall. Frank Luntz, welcome to The Issue It's for the very first time. So I got a question for you. Yeah. E-L-E-X. Yes. Why? Uh, because we took the E for my great grandmother, Ethel, and so we honor her with that. That's cool. So a shout out to Ethel. Do your viewers know this? I, I, some of them do, but now more of them do, thanks to you. <laughs> this, this, is, by the way, this is what I do is I ask questions. Yeah, and, and as do I. So let's start off with, with this question, the big question. What is the state of the presidential race right now? Who's ahead? I don't know what language you're allowed to use because this is broadcast. Go so for I to, it. I have to be very careful. <laughs> I would call it a shit show. Okay. And you can edit that if you need to. <laughs> uh, and that's the only definition. The candidates have gone low already, both of them. Trump lower. Uh, there's not really a focus on issues. It's much more on retribution, on criticism. And it's scary to me because the American people really are frustrated and they're very nervous about where we are as a country. They're nervous about the economy. They're nervous about security, both internally and externally. And in these focus groups that you show me doing, there's a level of frustration that comes out within five minutes. Give them a chance and their opening statements are not hopeful, but at least willing to look towards the future within five minutes they're at each other. They're at each other's throats. And, and so what do they want to hear? What would get them over the line towards Biden or Trump? Because I know you've suggested that you've that Biden right now, in your words, is losing the election, not that Trump is winning the election. How do you I, I, if I were Joe Biden, I'd be embarrassed. He's losing to a man who's been indicted 91 times. 85 of those still exist, with four different cases across the country, with other civil cases that he's facing. He had a, uh, uh, almost a, uh, I don't know if you call it an insurrection, whatever phrase you want to use about January 6th. And Joe Biden is losing to this guy. The economy is better. Inflation is down. Employment is up. Ar arguably, these are relatively good times for America and he's losing to Donald Trump. What does that say to you? What does it say? Good, I like that. <laughs> I will do this throughout this entire interview because you don't understand my job. It says, to, it says to me that most Americans think that Joe Biden is too old and they're wondering whether he's in control or not and they want somebody who's stronger, right? Isn't that what the focus group is saying? That's exactly what they're saying. And, and they're frustrated that we have these two candidates, 70% of Americans, don't want a rematch in 2020, and yet that's exactly what they're about to get. So uh, that's what the focus group is telling you. You're the word choice guy. You give candidates advice on how to talk about things. Uh, so let's first go to the Trump campaign. This week, we saw Donald Trump out selling Bibles. His new phrase is make America pray again, uh, offering it for 60 bucks. You can get a Bible, a constitution. I don't know if the viewers things. know this, but there are a couple of people that are here in this studio as we're having this conversation. And I can hear their comments as we talk about this. This is what's happening across America. They look at this and they say, what the hell are you doing? I guess I shouldn't use the word hell and Bible in the same sentence. Yeah. But they don't get it. This guy hawks sneakers, and clearly I care about sneakers, <laughs> for $300. Those same pair, supposedly gold em embossed, is now selling for 99 bucks. And this is within six weeks or eight weeks, selling Bibles? Do you have no shame? And I know that there are Trump people who are watching this and they're screaming at the TV right now. Right, they are. It's not appropriate. Can we agree that there's a way that a president should act? I'm gonna give you two words for both campaigns. Yes. The first one is enough. 
in all caps with an exclamation point. Enough with the failures, enough with the chaos at the border, enough with inflation, enough with partisanship, enough with negativity. The public is saying enough of all of this. And in that word, Trump benefits because enough is hostile to the status quo. The other one they're saying is results. We're tired of you talking to each other, yelling at each other, the two parties not getting along with each other, just fighting with each other. Enough of the status quo. We want a fundamental change. So that would be the word you would say to Trump, use the word enough. That's enough. your advice to him. Yes, enough of, uh, of immigration chaos. And what's the, what's the word for Joe Biden? You're giving campaign advice to them. How should he be speaking? It's about results. It's about addressing the threat of China. It's about engaging in creating stability in the economy. He's getting no credit at all None. for an economy that is relatively good. And that's because his own communication has failed. So how should he talk about it? Uh, for those of you who want to bring our supply chain home and don't want to depend on China, I've already done A, B, and C. For those of you who want a safe, uh, a safe, more secure environment, I've done D, E, and F. For those of you who want an economy that is predictable and stable, I've done G, H, and I. You put it in perspective of the voters themselves, because these are all questions and all priorities the voters have, and you put it in their perspective, and then you talk about what you did. Not what you did first, what you did after you put it in their perspective. It was pretty stunning watching your focus group talk about Kamala Harris, the vice president. They don't like your her. recent one. Basically, every single person said that she was a negative on the ticket um, and used pretty strong language against her. What do you make of that? And, and how should she change, assuming that she is going to stay on the ticket? And, and how can she be helpful? She's staying on the ticket because Joe Biden, if nothing else, is loyal. He doesn't dump people. And that's something to be admired in politics today. They don't believe she knows her brief. They don't believe she's put in the homework. They, he sent her to handle immigration. How long does it take for her to get to the border? And she doesn't acknowledge when she made a mistake. She should have gone immediately. That's what voters want you to do. To do. They want to see you addressing the challenge. They want you to get your hands dirty. And that's not what she did. And then she laughs it off. How do you change that? How do you prove to voters that you're serious when you think that these Tough questions are worthy of laughter. Yeah. I don't know how to fix that. Meanwhile, there was a, a new VP candidate uh, uh, this week, uh, Robert F. Kennedy, announcing that Nicole Shanahan uh, is going to be his pick. She is a California tech entrepreneur and attorney. Um, they had this big announcement in Oakland, which was her hometown. She's the ex-wife of Google co-founder Sergey Brin, so she's got some money. Uh, here's some of her announcement speech. So these are two of my political convictions I hold today. To serve peace and to help those in poverty. What do you make of, of her selection and, and of the Kennedy campaign? I make something significant of the Kennedy campaign because he's the vehicle for those who've had enough of the two-party system. She's clearly a progressive. And what's happening with Kennedy is he's actually drawing some Trump voters who don't like Trump's persona, but they still agree with his policies. Kennedy's this weird mix of left and right, and he's getting heard. He's at 10% in most nationwide polls, and some he's even above that. And in states like Michigan and Pennsylvania, he's scoring 15% and 18%. This is significant. He could end up in the debates. She's unknown, which is why you have to mention who she used to be married to, because that's, <laughs> unfortunately for her, that's her status right now. She's a good speaker. She breaks a number of glass ceilings. I don't believe that Kennedy has a path to the presidency. I do believe, not a spoiler, I believe that he has the opportunity to be a significant voice. I have issues with him, on, frankly, on science and on vaccines but I respect his point of view and I respect the 10% of Americans 
that are supporting him. Does she potentially, though, hurt him with the Trump voter who is sort of feeling out Robert Kennedy, thinks that he's aligned with them, and then they see he picks basically a former progressive Democrat who donated to George Gascone and, and basically disagrees with almost everything that they believe in. Is that a, a potential negative for him? He, his job is to navigate an independent, a truly independent from both political parties. So he's got some stuff that Trump voters like. He's got stuff that Biden voters like. He's more Democrat than he is Republican. He's more progressive than he is conservative. And she fits that. In the end, I believe that he takes two votes away from Biden for every one vote he takes from Trump. And I'll warn you here, if he does get the 15% and gets into the debates, he's going to hurt Biden more than he hurts Trump. And this is why the Democrats are, in an organizational way, spending millions of dollars to keep Kennedy off the ticket. And I say this to any viewer. I don't know where the camera is right now. You got a bunch of them. It's right here. Okay. The idea that the Democratic National Committee is spending money to prevent a legitimate campaign and candidate to keep them off the ballot, that is the most anti-democratic thing I've heard in 2024. I know that they're doing it. I know, understand the reason why they're doing it. It is not defensible. When our democracy is under threat, when people are so, they're already concerned that we've lost the rule of law, that we've lost support, that we don't believe in the credibility of elections right now. Yeah. To actively keep someone off the ballot who's getting 10% support, that is indefensible. And uh, they're going to pay for it. Kennedy told me recently he thinks that he takes more support from Trump than from Biden, but you disagree with that. Candidates never know who they take. Yeah. Candidates don't. You, that's not what by, they're good at. By the at. way, you think there's going to be a debate? I don't know. Oh, yes, I do. If Trump says he'll debate and Kennedy qualifies, he's got to get 15% of the vote, they will do exactly what they did in uh, 1980 when Ronald Reagan debated John Anderson because Jimmy Carter sat it out. Yeah. And that hurt Carter tremendously. He comes back in, Reagan comes up with, are you better off now than you were four years ago? And there's the campaign. That's it. Um, let's talk for a minute about California, because you live here. No, no, no. I visit here. You visit here. Well, you have a house here. Yes, but my heart and my wallet and my driver's license and my doctors are all in Nevada. Okay. I'm one of the people who left. You can't afford to live here anymore. Uh, well, that... Anyway, you'll be joining me. That, that seems, well, I do host the California show, so that's harder to do from Nevada. But let, let's talk about uh, our governor. You'll, you'll find a way. Our governor, um, Gavin Newsom, um, what do you make of him? And, and do you criticize him for what you just said? He's the, it, the truth is, if Gavin Newsom were the candidate against Donald Trump, Gavin Newsom would be the next president. You think he's a better candidate than Joe he's Biden? He's a much better candidate. He's already delivered the message against Ron DeSantis. They had the, that great debate on Fox News. Right. Uh, progressives versus conservatives, California versus Florida. The governor of Florida has got a really good record, but he's not a good communicator. Yeah. Gavin Newsom is a great communicator. And by the way, based on where the state is now, I am looking towards the next governor's election. And Gavin can't run again. Mark my words, this state is going to consider a business business expert, someone who's brought jobs, someone who understands what it is to make a payroll, someone who's got a vision of the state actually working, not politically, not ideologically, but in a common sense way, watch. Did Rick Caruso ask you to say that? Uh, no, he did not. And the fact that Rick Caruso, that's a good, that's yeah. a good response. Yeah. If Rick Caruso can't get elected mayor when this city has the problems that it has, I would find it very difficult to imagine him but, a but the, the city is more blue than the state is, and maybe a, a little bit more moderate might work in the state where there's more red areas. But. Which is why a moderate businessman who has a record of accomplishment, a track record, a meaningful measurable track record of creating success yeah. where there was none, that's what I'll be watching for. But Gavin, yeah. could you imagine Gavin Newsom and Donald Trump in the debates? It would be the highest rated debates we've ever had. I, people would tune in. They would yeah. have drinking games. We would... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the local bars here would be absolutely do you think packed. Gavin is missing his moment, though, that there are folks that feel like in politics you got to go when it's your moment and that four years from now that moment may pass. It may be the case. I know that nobody wanted to challenge Joe Biden. This is different than 1968. Again, I have to use a historic comparison. 
Eugene McCarthy challenged the sitting president, did really well in New Hampshire, and then Bobby Kennedy, the father, right. came in, and Johnson knew he had to get out. Right. Um, yes. Bobby Kennedy probably would have been the president if he... I absolutely, I believe that, and I think that that's one of the reasons why the presidential race is so significant yeah. for Bobby Kennedy, the son, to be running. And Gavin's got to be looking at this going, if I were there, because the only person who got a smile as good as you, sir... <laughs> Is Gavin Newsom, <laughs> and strangely, Gosh, enough, at, strangely he, enough, he looks the same. Strangely enough, uh, Gavin Newsom's ultimate role model in life is Bobby Kennedy, the father, who he keeps a picture of on his desk. Oh, I'm going to surprise you. Thing. Yeah, in my living room in Washington D.C. is a painting that used to hang in Bobby and Ethel's outer chamber. It's a beautiful painting. Bobby Kennedy is my role model too. Yeah, this guy understood pain and understood suffering and tried to alleviate it and still his line and I apologize I know you want to talk about politics but this is so important to me some men see things as they are and ask why I dream of things that never were and ask why not mm. to this day that is the most beautiful statement about what could be in America and what could be in California. Well, and speaking of that, you recently spoke to the National Governors Conference, which was Republicans and Democrats coming together in Washington, and you talked about words that could be used to try to bring the country together at a time when so much of the country is falling apart. Uh, wh what's the main message there? So I know you're showing a picture of me from that, and it just reminds me that I need to stop eating the brownies in the green room. <laughs> me uh, too. No, you're fine. Yeah. <laughs> By the way, do you go to the same tailor that the governor goes to? <laughs> no. You, you his look, is way more expensive. <laughs> you look like you could be his younger brother. Okay. <laughs> which he'll probably get mad at me over. Yeah. Um, that, the picture, you notice I'm kind of in the dark. Because yeah. I don't want to stand on the podium. Yeah. I wanted to be out there. I wanted to make eye contact with every governor. Because in the end, the change is not going to come through the Senate. It's not going to come through the House. And unfortunately, it's not going to come from the presidents. It's going to come from Amer America's governors. Who, who understand that it's not, which, it's not what you say, it's what people hear. Say what you mean, mean what you say, and most importantly, do what you say. This is what my focus groups keep telling me, and that's why I believe that a business person is so important for a state like this, because we need those principles right now. Um, we do something on this show called Personal Issues, which is 30-second rapid-fire your, your cultural favors oh. to get to know you a little bit better. So this is the first thing that comes to you mind. Didn't, you didn't warn me of this. I know. Well, it's more fun when you don't have a warning. This, this is, yeah. hey, uh, uh, do something, guys. Yeah. This, is, this is not fair. I can well, handle if all If you those... watch the show more often, we do this every time. So, I okay, here. Here. I know. I okay. told you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, here we go. Have some fun. First thing that comes to mind. If you want to pass, pass. Uh, what is your favorite TV show? Entourage, Doug Allen. Yeah. I can watch that show. Not in two. I'm not going to give Fav you a, favorite book. Um, uh, Walter Isaacson's biography of Steve Jobs. Great book. Favorite president. Teddy Roosevelt's personality and Ronald Reagan's policies. Favorite band or artist. Beatles. 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 What, what's your favorite Beatles. way to react? Relax. Watching Entourage while listening to the Beatles and <laughs> thinking about Ronald Reagan and Teddy Roosevelt. And, and Vice did this profile a few years back of your house here in Los Angeles. You have this amazing house with Are a- Are you gonna get me robbed here? With, no, I'm not saying where it is. I'm just, Los Angeles is a big place. We got, <laughs> I, got I don't want people really tracking people. me down. Is By the it, way, that's part it, of the problem here. Yeah. I have to be afraid. I see yeah. that you're showing pictures of my Oval Office. Yeah. You should have done this interview there. Yeah. Yes, that is a, an exact replica I owe Bill Clinton because his library shut down their Oval Office for 45 minutes to take exact measurements. Wow. And this is 78% uh, size. That's amazing. So I, and I do take it seriously. But the idea that you and I can have a normal conversation, I can even talk about the house, and I have to be afraid that someone's going to come and try to burn it down or attack yeah. it. We're, we attack people at their homes now. Yeah. We scream at their children. We've become so uncivil and so mean to each other. And I'm trying through whatever time I have left to try to be an honest broker, to try to tell the truth and the whole truth, and to try to find ways to bridge the gap because we're not doing it right now.
Well, thank you for being here. And we like to play music on this show. And I know you were a consultant on my favorite TV show of all time, The West, West Wing, Wing. Yeah. Uh, which we got to do another episode just talk about West Wing stories. Um, up next here on The Issue is we've got Katie Porter on her Senate candidacy. But we go to break with music from The West Wing. Frank Luntz, thanks for being here. Thank you for doing Great this. Great stuff. Appreciate it.